This is just an excerpt from a full episode. If you enjoyed what you hear here, go check out other full episodes, either on YouTube or as part of the podcast feed. Enjoy. Systemic news now. So, it cannot be denied that we were all surprised at the ability of anything to take our minds off the coronavirus outbreak that is currently happening. But when a Minneapolis police officer kneeled on the neck of citizen George Floyd over the case of a counterfeit $20 note and murdered him, it was the straw that was piled on the back of the camel that had already had its back broken a really long time ago. And unsurprisingly, protests broke out. Overnight, Minneapolis on fire. Protesters leaving an auto parts store in They were taken up worldwide as countries with troublesome colonial pasts that have used this public moment to examine their own histories. 300 years after his death, Edward Colston's fall from grace. For centuries, he took pride of place in Bristol, celebrated as a merchant, politician and philanthropist. And we here in Australia did some redecorating. Boston tea partying some statues into the nearest river. A surprising move from UK residents given that the last time someone did something like that, they, there was a bit of a war that followed. It also happened in the US, with statues being torn down all over. And Google Maps, as savvy as they are, has already updated the position of some of those statues. Good work, Google. However, the New Zealand town of Hamilton is just it's just doing this without any kind of riot like just taking all the fun out of civil disobedience now I don't know much about Hamilton as a place but from what I understand from doing gigs on the New Zealand comedy circuit it is the go-to town for a quick punch down reference to make the hometown crowd feel better sort of like the Frankston or the Geelong if you're on the Melbourne scene New Zealand continues to be the overachieving youngest sibling of the colonial family. We see you, New Zealand. We see you. Do you think you're better than us? Because you are. But you aren't allowed to think it. You must only quietly achieve. Australia has this thing about cutting down tall poppies. And don't forget, you used to be a part of us. You are at your heart. One of us. Whereas here at home, we didn't get quiet as enthusiastic. We merely vandalized our statues. Even vandalizing some statues from more recent history. With the busts of controversial PMs John Howard and Tony Abbott being vandalized in the aftermath of the recent protests, prompting a discussion about not erasing history by removing statues. Just like all those countries that had statues taken away from them by the Natural History Museum that stopped existing and stopped having an entire history because their statues were gone. I suppose you don't know about that because, as with the above stated problem, they now have no history and don't exist. And in all honesty, if you were to ask most Australians who the statues were of, they probably wouldn't know. Sure. They could Google it, but the majority of us wouldn't even know who to put into Google to find out who the statue is. And and a lot of us don't even know who is on the money. Refer to my Bill Gates $10 note conspiracy episode for more information about that. I mean, come on, that's a that's a $10 note. They think Bill Gates is on the $10 note. It's, it's not like it's a $100 note, a note that you don't see every day. This is a tenner. We look at one of these just about every day. 
So if people really want to know who the streets are named after, they can Google it. The government, or maybe one of those nationalist groups, can make a website dedicated to honouring the murderers of Indigenous lives. Call it something like um, Busty Historical Figures. The provocative name is the only way anyone's going to find the site, let's be honest. One statue, which is in discussion for change, is man you have never heard of and First Prime Minister of Australia, Edmund Barton. And while the First Prime Minister of Australia seems like a worthy figure to have as a statue, he even had the um, the jovial nickname Tosspot Toby. How fun is that? Tosspot Toby. Because he liked to drink. Sounds like a real Australian, right? The most Australian Australian to ever Australia. So what else did he do? Well, he was an early supporter of the Federation of the Australian Colonies, leading to Australia actually becoming Australia. Founded the Defence Force and the Commonwealth Public Service, which would go on to introduce nationwide women's suffrage. Sounding pretty good. Sounds like a stand-up dude. He also was uh, supportive of the Immigration Restriction Act. Oh, that doesn't sound very good. I mean, I guess this was back when policies could just have straight up names because nobody else had the right to fight back. So does exactly what it sounds like. It is a act for restricting immigration. And that act would then go on to evolve into the widest Pokemon. into the white Australia policy. So, where is this one particular statue of Edmund Barton? Somewhere respectful, no doubt, he asked, knowing full well that that wasn't the answer. Oh, oh, it's at an indigenous burial site? Who, who, who thought, who thought that was a respectful place for this statue? Now, fortunately, there is a petition on the way, and when asked, Port Macquarie Historical Society President Clive Smith said there was absolutely no reason that it could not be moved. Which is a real relief, because um, a historical society figure named Clive definitely sounds like the villain of a civil rights biopic. They have uh, some obscure but inconsequential piece of knowledge about the history of the village, like, oh, this is the very spot that Edmund Barton ate his first burrito. Uh, he ate it while plotting the statue of himself that will permanently oversee the indigenous burial ground. You know, real, real momentous historical event there. So statues are all over Twitter at the moment. It's a real cultural moment for people who have done super touristy visits, as that obscure photo of a statue that got zero likes previously can be repurposed into a revolution. Not to mention, all these years, we've been calling pigeons sky rats. But they were the ones leading the fight in colonialist, racist statue removal. All hail, Comrade Skyrat. But I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm I'm getting I'm getting distracted. It's sorry, super easy to get distracted. Uh, let's let's focus on home. Let's focus on a real moment from home. So uh, going back a little bit, on June second, roughly a week after the death of George Floyd, and the protests that followed, some very uncomfortable footage surfaced of a New South Wales police officer very roughly arresting an Indigenous boy. It doesn't matter where you're from. She swore, so what? If you got your police, you shouldn't be swearing at all. In America. I didn't say that at all, man. Yes, you need to open up your ears. What? I heard you from over here. I don't need to open up my ears. No, you didn't. So, no, you did not say that. I'm cracking your door, bro. What was that? What was that? Turn around, fucking things. I can't go. You're doing what? What? Oi! What the f? You slammed him on the face. You just slammed him on his face. Oi! What the f is this? What the f is this? What the He's in pain, but I've never heard that. You can see the officer went to the Cobra Kai school for arresting use and 80s villainy. 
sweep the leg. You have a problem with that? No, Sensei. No mercy. It came out later that the child had been a little mouthy to the officer, but in all honesty, I've been mouthy to officers before, and very rarely do I get the Cobra Kai treatment. So little, in fact, that one of the very few instances in which it did happen, I spent a good amount of time touring, telling as many people as I could about it, because it was so uncommon for me. And I decided to take a more respectful tactic this time. Uh, I say, no! <laughs> See ya! <laughs> this arm here is going to be my downfall. <laughs> takes that arm, twists it, puts it behind my back, slams it down onto the ground, gets good to him while he's there, handcuffs. Uh, I make my way back up onto my butt, and then uh, he asks to see my idea again. <laughs> But after that incident, and some public outcry, the cop was investigated over the arrest by the New South Wales Police Force. I think that so obviously shouldn't happen that they gave that opinion to eight-year-old Lisa Simpson. I mean, if you're the police, who will police the police? And that investigation turned up some shocking results. Turns out, after an intense internal investigation, the cop who arrested the indigenous team was charged with having a bad day. This is, this is not uncommon. There have been countless headlines about instances of this being a terrible idea. This is why they have never made a police show that centers around the internal investigations of the police. And they've made a lot of shows about increasingly obscure categories. There's funny cops, highway cops, existential cops, wheelchair cops, lady cops, country cops, water cops, ghost cops, computer cops, but no internal affairs cops. That show would be more predictable than an episode of Scooby-Doo. Remember, it is always the angry capitalist. And I'd have done it too, if you kids hadn't have come along. And I'd have found it if it wasn't for you snoopers. You blasted kids. Why didn't you mind your own business? Yes, I might have gotten away with it too. If it wasn't for these blasted kids and their dogs. Blasted meddling kids. And it would have been mine if it hadn't been for those meddling kids. And I would have made millions if it hadn't been for you meddling kids. Meddling young fools. Would have gotten away with a king's ransom. And I wish you'd have minded your own business. Well, in this case, it's police business. But a bad day, hey? bad day. Oh man, I cannot wait to return to work so that I can have my next bad day at work. The bar has been set pretty low for acceptable behaviour for someone mouthing off at you at work. I mean, the bar police have to leap over shouldn't be lower than the standards set by Shazza at the Bodolo. And I have seen some rough moments inside a Bodolo. Now look, if I had to choose who could exercise excessive force and leg sweeping on anyone they interact with, and my options were the police or the bottle attendant, I'm going bottle attendant every time. Following in the footsteps of our American counterparts, Australian capital cities and small towns alike saw people defying lockdown and risking everything for the future by taking to the streets to protest the systemic oppression of people, in this particular instance, black lives. The response from our exalted leader and primest of all the ministers, Scott Morrison, was to, to publicly declare Australia shouldn't import American style Black Lives Matter protests. Rather, we should keep our relationship with America at a safe, socially distant space, ensuring that we don't get infected with such crazy radical ideas as equality, free speech, and forming an independent state. Rather, we can keep our identity uniquely Australian and only ape the most important aspects of American culture, like needless and endless war in the Middle East, neoliberalism, and the suppression of native cultures and landmarks. 
In fact, so committed are we to this lifestyle choice that we have gone ahead and let mining multinational Rio Tinto blow up an important indigenous landmark, or rather, at least 40, and maybe as many as 86 significant Aboriginal sites in the central Pilbara region of Western Australia. Because if you are going to destroy a culture, you go big or you go home. These were sites that a BHP archaeological survey identified as containing rock shelters that were occupied between 10,000 and 15,000 years ago and noted that evidence in the broader area showed occupation of the surrounding landscape has been ongoing for approximately 40,000 years. Making the destruction of the site consistent with Australian attitudes and sentiment towards the stolen generation which ended a mere 50 years ago and white Australians are always telling indigenous people to get over it and wondering why they'd still be talking about it when it happened so long ago. And all this happened during Reconciliation Week, a barely recognised week intended to celebrate Indigenous history and culture in Australia and foster reconciliation discussion and activities. Getting screwed over by white Australians is now a significant part of Indigenous culture, so it seems Rio Tinto has gotten on board with celebrations. But Angry Dad, who wants the neighbours to go to bed already because he has to be up early for church in the morning, and Prime Minister Scott Morrison has demanded an end to further Black Lives Matter protests, saying, Some protests have been hijacked by left-wing movements, and demonstrators at future events should be charged. Despite that same day, proudly announcing that AFL crowds of 10,000 would be allowed to return to stadiums of seating of roughly 40,000. Even though we haven't even gotten close to that magic 40% number we apparently needed to download the COVID safe app. Or else we wouldn't be getting the pubs back. Remember that empty threat when the prime minister told us that if we didn't download a tracing app that the pubs wouldn't open again? Whatever happened to that, Morrison? Oh, what's that? It never really worked. And it had uh, undisclosed issues in as many as 25% of phones? Huh. Weird how we don't talk about that. Okay, so, some of us did a protest. So now, seems we will be punished. He must be thinking, if 10,000 people can gather for civil rights, then they can gather for doing an economy, especially if that economy is a sports-related economy. It's sort of like a yin and yang. Though, given the size of the Hillsong gatherings, it would not surprise me to find out that he was doing this all so that he could make the reality of his pre-lockdown promise to go to the church and then go to the rugby. Imagine how long it is going to take to get 10,000 people into a stadium while safely observing social distancing. It's basically turned the stadium into an airport. Come to think of it, every business is an airport now. You must arrive three hours early, get your temperature checked, and don't you dare drink or eat anything because the public toilets will be a nightmare. People will be making money selling snacks to the queue out of the Apple store. But really, I suspect that he's pushing this whole thing because New Zealand is already opening and his number one strategy for this whole pandemic has been to copy everything Auntie Jacinda does. So obviously, we must be open too because New Zealand is open. Essentially, we are the kid cheating off the kid next to us in the biggest test that we've ever taken, but we failed to realize that the kid next to us is a full page ahead. Of. But more importantly, a few weeks back when there were more active cases and the lockdown was seemingly more imperative, there was a protest against 5G. A protest? A protest? Well, best get the PM out here. He's not going to be happy with that. He definitely has made his position on protests very clear. He's going to be livid. All right, let's have a look at what he said. Let's have a look at what his official statement was. Oh, it's a free country. Yeah, I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong, Morrison. I want to get rid of the anti-5G crowd as much as anybody and maybe gathering them all together so that they'll infect each other is a great way to do that. But this approach where you approve 
the 5G protests but disapprove a Black Lives Matter protest, Shaw comes off as, how do I put this delicately, uh, blatantly racist. Maybe that's something you should think about. So the New South Wales Police Minister seems to be on board with this approach, saying protests of larger than 10 could be deemed illegal, which is a strong stance for a police force to take when they were the only state to surround and attack protesters without provocation. I mean, come on, even troubled sibling Queensland managed to make a protest a peaceful event, handing out masks to protesters so that they would be safe. And what are the results of these protests being? Well, let's have a look at some of the headlines. Oh, no. This is, a, this is not good. Black Lives Matter protester has come down with COVID. What's that? There were seven other cases on the same day. So then why are we only focusing on, on the Black Lives Matter protester in this headline? Who wrote this? Oh, the name isn't given in the article. Okay, that's weird. And I mean, let's be honest, it's likely an editor's choice to put that title because it's a free news source and it needs to make its money by generating a little bit of outrage at the expense of this movement. So the press coverage of the newest outbreaks in Victoria have been very telling about the narrative that a few people want to see. So have a look at this one. Again, highlighting second Black Lives Matter protester among 12 new cases. Why wasn't the headline here 12 new cases? Why did it only mention specifically that one of them was a Black Lives Matter protest? And let's have a look here. We've got, uh, yep, again, highlighting the Black Lives Matter protester. Uh, yep, all right. So in, in this article, this uh, protester was one of 18 cases that day, but those other 17 cases were not mentioned in the headline. Oh, and let's have a look here. Third Black Lives protester among Victoria, one of 19 cases. Okay, so one of 19 cases. So they've acknowledged that there are other cases, but they didn't bother to highlight what the other cases were. As of this recording, there are 116 active cases in Victoria. And of those 116, three have been people who attended a Black Lives Matter protest. That's that's a statistically insignificant percentage. I mean, you'll get a higher number of cases related to a single family than you would from uh, people who showed up to these protests. And that can change at any moment. And I'm, I'm happy to accept that, that that's basically probably is what's going to happen. But it does underpin the narrative that we do and don't want to tell. There's a problem that needs addressing. And there's something that we are not keen to acknowledge. So have a look here. This uh, Sydney councillor claims that the acknowledgement of country divides us more. And in an email, he said, however, if you would suggest that we should also acknowledge people brought against their will from England in 1788 and European settlement for making our country what it is today, plus uh, those who fought and died for us, then yeah, I would agree. Going on to ask this very reasonable question, how do you know they didn't wipe out another race when they arrived 70,000 years ago. I mean, he's gone full all theoretical genocides manner on the issue. Seems he is preparing to break away from the party and start his own political party, the unwilling criminals, European settlers and potential indigenous genociders party, running on the very catchy slogan, make Australia what it is. No wonder the New South Wales cops were the only group to cause trouble when they are doing mock versions of the acknowledgement of country at their Christmas party, replacing all references to indigenous people with references to the tactical unit. Man, it sounds like these guys should be the personal guard of that Sydney councillor. Real, true white knights coming to the rescue here, putting the white in white knight. Then we went out and did this. We gave Tony Remote Communities are a Lifestyle Choice Abbott, the Queen's Honour for Indigenous Service and Border Control. Now, unless we are saying that Abbott's strict border measures are to stop another group of interlopers from coming in and taking the land that the Indigenous people have gotten back, thus starting the cycle of war all over again, then maybe I can get behind an award if that were the case. But it's not. And unsurprisingly, Pauline Hansen has shown up all upset that nobody has talked about her for like a few days. So she fired up the perpetual blunder machine that she calls a mouth and attempted to pass an all lives matter motion in parliament. 
Now, we don't know what she wanted to include specifically as she was almost unanimously voted down from causing an unnecessary and racist distraction, with the only exception being Conservative Senator Jim Mullen, who walked out saying all senators should have the right to have their opinions heard. A strong take to have given that Mullen was an Abbott government special envoy for Operation Sovereign Borders and has been credited as the architect of the Stop the Boats campaign, which is as good as being credited as being the architect of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. So I guess what he was saying was all opinions matter? It's likely she was just upset because nobody came to her aid when she did prison. There were no riots, nobody took to the streets, except maybe to cheer and to find a friend to cheers a beer. If she were to stop and look around, the senator would find plenty of white people being outraged, often by things that they haven't thought through all that well. We, however, have heard enough from Senator Chicken Little. She is using her superpower, the power of distraction, to distract us, and we must not get distracted from the real issues. Oh, but look, look, even Hello Kitty and Good Amara are good allies. I mean, as much as a company can be a good ally, and, 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 oh, 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 did you hear, did you hear? Cops has been cancelled. Oh, Cops has been cancelled after the violence of the protests. I mean, they were telling us the whole time. They chose the song with the lyrics, bad boys, bad boys. That was, that was the only message that the producers took from a song about growing up as a teenager, trying to make sense of a world and becoming semi-aggressive in the process. And all they took was, bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? when they come for you. Oh, and look, and look at this. Netflix has removed Chris Lee's show due to blackface. Oh, and also David Williams and Matt Lucas's Come Fly With Me and Little Britain have been taken down due to insensitive content, mostly blackface. So while in their countries of origin, the shows in question were pretty well known. If we are being fair to Netflix, I think it is fair to assume that anything made post the jazz singer, unless it was an autobiography of Al Jolson, of course, wouldn't have people with blackface. So when this uh, foreign company rolled in and picked up a few local shows to fill in KPIs regarding local content, they just picked up things that they heard were popular. After all, blackface was a ceremonial white person activity reserved for special occasions, like Halloween, also known as Blackface Christmas, or an appearance on Red Faces. In the same way, cultural appropriation was supposed to be reserved purely for music festivals, where we could blame it on the drugs. Some people, and by people I mean attention-seeking bots, designed to create maximum outrage for ad revenue and mind you, not the show's creators. They have made their money and are wisely shutting up while the shutting up is good, have argued cancelling the shows is the end of reason. Supposedly, instead, Joe Hildebrand would have these alternatives put in place. As Netflix is famous for its obscure listings, it can group all of the controversial shows together under the banner, surprisingly late use of blackface. Or we can create a website akin to Does the Dog Die? It's called Is There Blackface? It will have subsections for other forms of offense like white girl wearing Native American headdress, Gay face, which is when a straight actor plays an over-the-top gay stereotype. Um, Scarlett Johansson, which is when a white person plays an Asian, a tree, or an animal. Because although Does the Dog Die has really branched out to include all sorts of triggers and fears like Are there bugs? Or A dragon dies? Or There's farting and spitting? It does fail to list dressing as another race. Ha! Gotcha, does the dog die? You're cancelled. Ah, oh, shit. I'm distracted again. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's just very hard to... It's very hard to focus because, you know, systemic issues are much harder than pop cultural issues and they're much, much harder to fix, whereas pop cultural issues tend to go away quite quickly. All right, let's, let's keep this rolling. Okay. Now... On to man who has appeared so many times in this story that I don't have a new joke for him, and Prime Minister Scott Morrison. He was talking about the Black Lives Matter protests. And as his representative for the Ministry of Putting Your Foot in Your Mouth was out, he figured he would be like most Australians and do two jobs to get by, saying that 
there was no slavery in Australia. Okay. Okay. Now, technically, this is true, but that is a massive technically. And realistically, on the issue of indentured servitude, slavery and forced labor, semantics is not where you want to land. Semantics are the last resort of losing a battle on Reddit. They're not gonna change history. But for the sake of argument, in Australia, the practice was actually called blackbirding, as Alexander Downer will happily attest to. When asked whether the practice of blackbirding could be considered slavery, Morrison told reporters he did not want to get into the history wars which is the worst prequel of the film set in the extended Wars universe. Those include Civil War, Charlie Wilson's War, and Star Wars. This was a deflecting statement that showed he had never heard the term before. Like most white Australians, I would bet, I certainly had never heard the term before. So let me elaborate. Blackbirding is a term used to describe the practice of coercing, a term so mild that the grammar corrector on Google Docs keeps requesting that I change it to forcing people to work as indentured laborers, often through deception or force. It was common throughout the Pacific in the 19th century. The etymology of which is the that the term may have been formed directly as a contraction of blackbird catching. Blackbird was a super respectful slang term used for local indigenous people. So blackbirding stopped in 1901 with the introduction of the White Australia policy. So one of those historical moments that while it is progress, because we're no longer blackbirding people, it's not exactly the kind of progress you celebrate, like overthrowing a dictator, only to replace him with a puppet emperor. Then, subsequently, the Pacific Labor Act was introduced, which was designed to facilitate the mass deportation of South Sea Islanders working in Queensland's sugar industry. 15% of those blackbirded to Australia died from exposure to foreign illness, malnutrition, mistreatment. And of those who lived, some were sent home to the wrong island, but some managed to stay in Australia. So, no, no, no slavery per se, but it wasn't exactly a haven out here for non-white people. He would eventually apologize, acknowledging that there have been all sorts of hideous practices that have taken place. And so I'm not denying any of that. Cool, real cool of you to not deny some bad stuff happened. But you know, he's not denying it. He's not denying bad stuff happened, so don't be stupid. Don't be stupid and risk your life to highlight the struggles of indigenous people because the PM already knows. You're just embarrassing yourselves, really. He's all over it and I'm sure he is as outraged as you are and is getting right on to doing something about it. Oh, hey, look, diverse skin tone band-aids from Band-Aid. And it's only taken a hundred years. I mean, that's pretty fast on the uh, acknowledging things are missing from history timeline, you know, as far as companies go. 